Walston had been in the Slot Canyon for only 15 minutes when the accident happened that day. It was approximately 2.45 p.m. when he encountered this boulder blocking his path. Are we standing on the That's Dillon? the boulder. That's the Dillon boulder. That's the boulder, yep. It's now near the bottom of the canyon, but that day it was actually several feet higher, wedged between the canyon walls. The easiest way for me to get down was to use that as an intermediate step. And so uh, I stood on it and kicked at it uh, and then stepped onto it. It seemed to be solid, but as Ralston climbed over it, lowering himself off the backside of the boulder, it suddenly tumbled. I was hanging from the boulder, from the top of it, where the last good handholds were. And that was when it shifted. So I dropped down here and the boulder came and it smashed my left hand here and it smashed my right hand up here and then it, it slid down and it actually dragged my arm down and my arm was right about here. Do you remember at all what you were thinking when it was sliding down the side of the wall? It was coming at me. I mean, it, I, was, I was trying to get out of the way. Uh, and just my instincts were just to clear my head, uh, get my head out of the way. It, it didn't even occur to me that my hands could get, could get trapped. It just and it happened fast. No more than a few seconds. When it was over, he was pinned to the canyon wall by an 800-pound rock. At the bottom of the hole in a hidden canyon 100 feet beneath the desert surface, 20 miles from the nearest paved road, surrounded by hundreds more miles of uninhabited desert. That's when Aaron Ralston realized that he had violated one of the most basic rules of the outdoors. Always, always make sure someone knows where you are. But in a lapse from his normal routine, Aaron had not told a soul. He wasn't expected back at work for days. No one would miss him. And when they did, they wouldn't know where to begin to look. He was completely alone. That Aaron Ralston found himself in such an isolated, life-threatening situation was ironic in several ways. Over the last few years, he'd mounted one daring expedition after the next and attained elite status in the climbing world. He'd faced real danger and cheated death on more than one occasion. For someone of his expertise, Blue John Canyon should have been a Sunday walk in the park. It had not always been that way. Aaron had started life in Indianapolis, his family relocating to Denver when he was 12. Even then, the Western transplant was more of a bookworm than an outdoors jock. His studious nature and analytical mind led him to engineering. Ralston graduated at the top of his class from prestigious Carnegie Mellon with a double major, engineering and French. He minored in piano performance. This recording is of Aaron performing a Schumann composition as a teenager. After graduation, Aaron landed a lucrative job with tech giant Intel. His career seemed secure, but something was missing. That something turned out to be the outdoors. As he moved throughout the West for Intel, Aaron developed a passion for outdoor adventure, hiking and climbing and skiing, his home video camera always in hand. <coughs> he was inspired to take up mountaineering after seeing the IMAX movie Everest and after reading John Krakauer's book, Into the Wild. It was a story about how this young man from the East Coast left college, got rid of all his possessions, lived out of his vehicle for a few years, uh, traveled the United States, and it became uh, kind of a, I guess, this prize in the sky that, that someday I would have a truck, that I could live out of my truck, that I could go and do whatever I wanted and travel when I wanted to and, and not be tied down by an occupation or a career. Both of the true life tales that inspired him ended in disaster. The young man in the book died, stranded in the wilderness. So did eight of the climbers in the Everest film. But Ralston was not discouraged. He approached climbing and mountaineering with the same intensity as his academic life, setting goals, checking them off. And one of his goals 
to scale all of Colorado's 14ers. Those are peaks over 14,000 feet, and there are more than 50 of them. My hand is cold from operating the cameras. He accomplished that in no time, so he upped the ante. He tried to summit all the 14ers in the middle of winter, and he would climb every one of them solo. That was an endeavor so difficult, it had never been done before. Winter solo 14er number 33. He probably had been doing solo mountain climbings maybe six or eight months before he really told us what he was up to and what he was doing. He probably knew I disapproved. It's not the kind of goal that most parents are delighted to hear about. Donna and Larry Ralston were no different. You know, we put a high priority with our children of having them be independent, of wanting them to uh, be curious about the world and explore. And you can't have that philosophy on one hand and be saying, well, we meant everything except that. You, you know, uh, that's not the way uh, I think life works. There's ice, there's steep snow. But Ralston's frequent trips were requiring him to take more and more time away from his job. Two years ago, when he was invited to climb Mount McKinley, he had to make a choice, set out on a life of adventure or keep his job. He quit the job. You were a well-trained engineer with a degree from a first-rate university, making a handsome salary. <laughs> was that hard to give up? Not really. He packed his belongings into that truck that he'd always wanted and headed to Aspen, where he took a job at the Ute Mountaineering store. His financial security was gone now, but his new job allowed him to work with others who shared his love for outdoor adventure. And his ambitious drive to climb all of Colorado's 14ers solo in the winter continued. Just the fact that no one else has ever done it before it just proves how difficult it is. Brian After was Aaron's manager at the Aspen store. If you break your leg, you don't have anyone who can go get help, don't have anyone who can help you back, it's just you. Ralston admits that he's had more than a few close calls in his life. Hey, you heard? None more so than the one that came two months before the canyon accident. Ralston was skiing with friends in the backcountry of the Rocky Mountains, despite a warning of high avalanche danger. As usual, he had his video camera in hand. And then all of a sudden it was like being hit by a bus. Just boom, we knocked over, tumbling through the snow. It was a class five avalanche, that's as big as it gets. I was buried up to my neck uh, with only my right hand sticking out of the snow. It brought us closer to death than I'd ever been and certainly um, was something that very easily could have killed us. Well, there are those who say your decision to ski into that bowl when the avalanche conditions were so mm -hmm. severe was Aaron the cowboy. Yeah, the, the kind of the, the lone star, yeah, moose cannon. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've heard it. Suffice to say, it was a big one. It was just the kind of disaster that Donna Ralston had worried about. That was a very close call. It was. We didn't find out about that until almost two months later. So that was uh, kept quiet and under cover. Uh, he didn't want Mom to know, obviously. I would have been uh, shaken in my shoes and probably shaking him. Did you sit down and have a talk with him? Uh, I actually went to Aspen and sort of lectured him about being too risky. For people who are watching this and just don't get it, how do you describe that intersection between risk and the rush that comes with doing something well and testing yourself? I think there's a different intersection for all of us. Yeah. I'm out there primarily to feel the experience, whatever it is. For me, it's, a, it's more an exercise in, in judgment and decision making that I try to practice. Were you looking for any kind of an intersection when you set off for Utah that day? No, that was a vacation. I was looking to get away from it a little bit. It was like going to the beach for me. But on what he thought would be one of his least dangerous trips, Ralston would make what he says was the biggest mistake of his life. Aaron Ralston had set out that Saturday morning for a carefree desert hike through Blue John Canyon but with no warning, he had descended into hell. Ralston was more than 100 feet underground, pinned to the canyon wall by an 800-pound boulder, his right arm crushed. The pain was overwhelming. How much did it hurt? Definitely worse than any pain I'd ever felt. And that pain quickly gave way to panic. 
I threw myself against the boulder and it, uh, half an hour or 45 minutes of that, just trying to get my, my knee up onto this boulder and lifting up, pushing up, resisting it in every way I could. But still, it was my hand was trapped and progressively the, the pain faded as, as, uh, as my hand lost sensation. And he struggled to remain calm. I got my water bottle out. I drank about a third of my water bottle right off, the, just from the exertion I was sweating from trying to heave against the boulder. It was clear he couldn't move the boulder, but using his pocket knife, maybe he could chip away enough of it to free his arm. I wanted to first off to figure out how solid was the rock, how, how strong was my knife in, in trying to chip at it, and so it was just an experiment at first. I got my knife out. You have that knife? I do have that knife. A cheap pocket knife, an imitation leather man with a few flimsy blades, pliers, and a file. That's not the world's greatest rock cutting tool. No, I just held it like this and chip, 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 tap, 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 like that. He chipped and tapped for the rest of the afternoon to no avail. And as the sun fell lower in the sky, the realization set in that it would soon be dark. He'd be here overnight or longer. You have to do an inventory at some point. You don't have a lot with you. I didn't have a lot with me to, to begin with, and I knew what I had in my backpack, but I had my water out. I had about 22 ounces of water. I had my food bag, and I knew that I had two burritos left, and that was it. And I knew that the water would be the, the main challenge as far as a long-term uh, existence there. He laid out the rest of what he had carried in his backpack. Items like these, a rope and his rock climbing gear, a video camera, digital camera, and a Walkman, and fortunately, a small headlamp. Walston's engineering training took over, analyzing, then reanalyzing, his best odds for making it out alive. His options, he knew, were few. One, that he could somehow move the boulder, either by continuing to chip away at it, or shifting it somehow, but both seemed unlikely. Option two, wait for someone to find him. Other hikers out for the weekend or a search party once people realized that he was missing. But the odds of that kind of a rescue seemed low. He'd picked Blue John Canyon precisely because of its remote location. And of course, he had told no one where he was headed. Then, there was option three. The option of, of amputating my arm. Did you think about amputating right away? I, I, I pretty well knew that that, was, uh, that that was at least an option I had to consider and that I, I really didn't want to have to do that. And I even had a little conversation to, to myself. I spoke out loud to myself and, and said that you're going to end up having to amputate your arm to get out of here. And, and then responding that I didn't want to have to do that. Um, but it was it was an option from the beginning.